congregation who rented me a nice car and took care of all of my expenses so I could be there just to represent them. And so Tabernacle Baptist Church is indeed recognized, known about, and appreciated by many of our politicians in D.C. And I thank you for Steve, Pastor Steve's given me the opportunity to go and trust in me to do a job that would not embarrass him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Time for us to sing a little bit. I want you to stand to your feet and I want you to sing with me a little chorus. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus found me. Now, we got the words up here so you can see it. But you have to understand, sometimes Pastor Steve gets kind of caught up in it and he sings things that's not up there. So you sing those words because I find it a wonder that Jesus loves me. And I'm glad that he found me. Sing it with me. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loved me. Out in the darkness, no light could I see. Oh, what a wonder. This morning? Amen. Are you happy about it? Amen. Let's sing it one more time, okay? Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loved me. saves. Amen. 438 in your hymnals. 438. Let's sing about this wonderful news that Jesus saves. All right. 438. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves.
That's all. Stand up. 400. 34. 400. 34. Revive us again. 400. Jesus Christ had ascended up into heaven and they took the gospel unto the uttermost parts of the earth. One of those great churches was a church at Ephesus. Great church. But the Lord said, I have somewhat against thee. You've lost your first love. He said, you've left your first love. Are you saved this morning? I hope you're saved. Does the love of Christ dwell within your hearts? We don't need to lose our love for Him and for others. Sing that fourth verse. Notice the words, revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. Sing it. Revive us. shake somebody's hand. The choir's going to come down and join you. I tell you, that's just wonderful. 
I love seeing you fellowship one with another and enjoy each other. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for your faithfulness and your ministry. Our ministry consists of a lot of many different things, and we have servants, and I appreciate those servants that whether you're singing or you're working in the nursery or out on the buses, I appreciate each and every one of you. Those that visit, thank you for that which you do and sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with others and inviting folks to come to Tabernacle. That's a joy, and I want to encourage you. Bring somebody with you next Sunday. Bring, four for your, uh, bring food for your four and four more and bring somebody with you, and let's have a great day next Sunday. Now, you've got to pray, pray much. It would be just a terrible thing for us to have a social I mean, to come together and have a big crowd and everybody wear Western attire and hear a little Western music and say, boy, that was good. Let's go eat some food. Oh, that was great. It'd be a sad thing. But I'd like to be able to do all of that and enjoy the blessings of an almighty God and see people saved and see hearts rekindled, see us warmed up to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ushers, come with your offering trays. Give us an opportunity to take part in this aspect of our ministry, and that's our giving. And I appreciate your faithfulness in giving. Come on down. Winston, uh, I appreciate you. Boy, he looks good, doesn't he? Amen. He's waiting to the, be the last one so he can, so everybody can see. I asked him last week if, if I would look kind of silly wearing a bow tie. And he told me no. So these younger folks, they like bow ties. So I'm just thinking about wearing a bow tie one Sunday. And Kevin's got white socks on, so I can wear white socks. I'm not going to say anything about Billy. That's, that's the way I wear my hair, folks. Just mine's not as long as his. I love him. I, Bill, you know, I talked with a guy about coming to church one day, and he said, you know, I'm not going to church. He said, if I go to church, a preacher will embarrass me. And he'll say, oh, look at so-and-so. He's in church. I hope I'm embarrassing you. <laughs> but I love you, Bill. You know that. I love you. And uh, I do love him, and I'm thankful for him. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your giving. I'm glad the Blackmans joined the church. And uh, they've been friends and have attended here for several months. And they joined the church. And I'm so happy about that. Brother Blackman, would you pray and ask God blessing our offering this morning? Yes. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Amen. <laughs>
545. Let's stand up one more time. Moment by moment. 545. church for children it came in with moms and dads between the ages of four and ten young folks parents if you would like to never mandatory that the children leave but if you'd like for them to they're on the other side of this wall after the service you'll just go right over there and you'll collect your young folks the so young folks you come right now I want us to sing that chorus one more time I want you to look at it think about what you're saying as we sing moment by moment I'm kept in his love. Sing it, just the chorus. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. seated. I want to take you back over to the book of Mark, Mark chapter number five, Mark chapter number five. 
I am really enjoying doing this little walk through Mark, and uh, I'm learning a lot of things. I'm hoping I'll share some things with you that'll stir your heart a little bit for Jesus. And today we're going to talk about that woman that is, she had an issue of blood. The Bible says for 12 years, my, my. And she said, if I could just touch Jesus, if I could just touch Jesus. You know, it's in order to be able to touch Jesus, you have to get close. He said, who touched me? And they said, uh, Lord said that there's a multitude around you. You're being throned. We're getting our ladies situated. Thank you. And he said, there's a lot of people around you. How is it you say, who touched me? Everybody's touching you. This little lady had to push her way through, I said last week. Stretch her arms to be able to reach out and touch Jesus. We need to be close to him, folks. You need to be close to him. Before we read any scriptures together, Alan and Andresa are going to sing for us. And 
I've shared with you that there's a number of miracles in the book of Mark, and I was just wanting to walk through Mark with you and share you some thoughts with, about these miracles that Jesus was performing. In Mark chapter number 5, there's three miracles that has taken place, and Jesus is demonstrating His power. Now, He says in Matthew chapter 28, all power is given unto me. His power was creative power. The Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him, there was not anything made that was made. In verse number 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 17 says that uh, the law came by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. It says that Word created, the Word was made flesh, and we know His name. His name is Jesus. The power of God rests in Him. Do you know the Bible says that in Him all things consist? Not only is there creative power, but there is a consisting power. Now, I'm told that in the Greek that that word consist has to do is where we get our English word adhesive. It's super glue. It's that in Him all things are held together. In Him all things consist. His power is a creating power. His power is a consisting power. And His power is a changing power. See, the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that His Power is saving power changes us. And no longer are we servants unto sin, but we're servants under Jesus Christ to live for Him. What a wonderful thing that His power does. And in Mark chapter number 5, we find out that Jesus has power. He leaves from one side of the sea and goes over to the other side of the sea. And there, he, when He reaches the shore, there's this wild man that comes out of the tombs. No man could tame him. And so I say that that man was demon possessed. Demon is not found in your Bible. He is a man filled with unclean spirits. But we know the word demon. And so I use the word demon there. And Jesus shows that he has power over the demonic world. There's a legion. There's a hundred demons. A hundred unclean spirits. And Jesus cast them out. The question that the unclean spirits have of the Lord Jesus Christ, have you come to torment us before our day? There's a day coming when the demons, the unclean spirits, the devils, will be tormented. God's going to take and cast them into the lake of fire. And there they'll burn forever and forever. That's hell, folks. Hell's not made for us. It's made for the devil and his angels. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you reject God's wonderful and marvelous grace, you'll die and go to a devil's hell. Jesus has power over that. Actually, the Bible says in Revelation that he has the keys to death and hell. It's right there on his, on his apron string, if I may say. And I'm thankful. 
He has power over the demonic world, but he also has power over death. And we saw last week how that this man, he was a ruler in the synagogue. He came to Jesus and said, my daughter is sick. She's nigh to death. And Jesus goes to his house and Jesus takes and raises this little girl from the dead. Before they arrived there, there was a servant that came and said, don't trouble him anymore. Do you know it's never a trouble for us to go to Jesus? Yeah. It may be trouble on our part. I don't know when I'm going to have time to pray. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> normally when I get down to pray and close my eyes, I normally drift off to sleep. I call it meditation. <laughs> I'll go home and eat today, and I don't know my wife fixed food that I'm allergic to. I don't know what that means. I don't know what she's saying. But after I eat, about 30, 45 minutes later, my eyes swell shut. <laughs> Jesus had power over death, hell, and the grave. I'm glad. I'm glad that he can take those of us that are dead in our trespasses and in sin and quicken us. Make us alive. Did I wake you up? And make us alive. I'm thankful for that. Boy, I hope you know the Lord Jesus Christ and his power. But not only does he have power over the demonic world, not, not only does he have power over death, but he has power over disease. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I am a product of the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he healed me from my sin sickness. He may be a new creature. Uh, Billy Kelly was an old a North Carolina, Tennessee moonshiner who got saved, and he said he never quit drinking. He just changed fountains. Some of you may even remember Oliver B. Green, great tent revivalist and on the radio for many years. And Oliver Green, I've heard him a thousand times say that he drinks all he wants to drink. God just changed his wonder. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He changes us from being a dead creature to a live creature, alive unto him. He changes us from disease, sin sick, and helps us to understand what his forgiveness is all about. To think that the God in heaven, the holy and righteous one, forgives us. And it's all because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So today I want to talk with you a little bit about touching Jesus. This woman who had a disease, she wanted to reach out and touch the Lord Jesus Christ. It's kind of interesting to me also that in this chapter you find a couple of things that are similar in our passage because uh, the, uh, the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, comes to Jesus and he beseeches Jesus to come to his house and heal his daughter who is sick. And on his way, this woman comes and she stops. She interrupts their travel and she touches Jesus and she's healed. The daughter of Jairus was 12 years of age. And this woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. I thought about Jairus. I thought about how Jairus thought that his 12 years with his daughter was such a short period of time. Now, I believe Jairus had faith. And I believe because of his faith, he believed that Jesus was going to heal his daughter, even though she was dead. But I wonder if there's anything that went through his mind. I know for me, if my granddaughter, 12 years of age, were to die, I would be saddened by it because I would say that it was such a short period of time. But here there is this woman who has an issue of blood for 12 years. And she did not view it as a short period of time. She viewed it as longevity. 
I have been this way for over 12 years. Let's read some scripture together. Look with me at Mark chapter number 5. And let me begin reading in verse number 21. <clears throat> Jairus has come and Jairus has <clears throat> asked Jesus. And so they're on their way. And the Bible says that, uh, uh, and when Jesus was passed over again in the ship to the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. When he saw him, he fell at his feet. He besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay your hand on her, that she may be healed and that she may live. I said that I'm a product of the healing power of God. I was, in an I was in a motorcycle accident in August of 77, and uh, I was very fortunate that it didn't kill me. Uh, there was a telephone repair man was on a telephone pole, and right where I had my accident, he said, you were as high in the air as I was on the pole. I hit the side of a car on my motorcycle and it just catapulted me up into the air. When I hit the pavement, I hit on my helmet. Thank God I had a helmet on. My head broke the helmet. It wasn't the pavement, I have a hard head. Not only did it shatter my helmet, it knocked my helmet around sideways on me. I was in the hospital for several days and out of work for six months. God was so good to me. I was in the emergency room and Brenda's cousin was an emergency room nurse there that night and she came to me and she said, Steve, she said, they're going to have to do surgery on your leg. And she said, who do you want? And I said, I want the best. And she said, that would be John Sanders. The great physician visited me that night Folks, let me tell you something. This is, this is not a type story. John Sanders came in. It was after 10 o'clock when he got there. And he said, uh, we're going to look at this leg. And he began to clean my leg up. And he said, something's wrong. He said, we need to take you back down and get some more pictures. They'd already taken me to x-ray and x-rayed me. They x-rayed me a second time, and they brought me back to the emergency room there. And Dr. Sanders came in, and he said, Steve, we don't understand this. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong, Doc? He said, let me show you. Your hand? He said, the hand, look at your hand. He said, look at your thumb. And he held up another x-ray, and he said, this is your hand when you came in. This is your hand now. He said, your thumb is a dislocated thumb that's been reset. Here it's dislocated. Here it's been reset. Your little finger. Mm. But here it's not broken. Your wrist is not broken. Your leg is not broken. Your ankle is not broken. And they were showing me these slides, these x-rays. Here it is, here it's not. Here it is, here it's not. Here it is, here it's not. Here it is. We don't know what happened. And I said, I know what happened. The great physician, the great physician visited with me. I don't believe in divine healers, but I, do, I believe in divine healing. And I believe he has power over even the diseased and the disabled. The Bible says, verse number 25, and a certain woman, well, verse 24, and Jesus went with him, talking about Jairus, and much people followed him. And they throned him. Verse 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. Notice she had suffered many things 
of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee. Why sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. My Father, I pray that you'd help me in these next few moments for your glory and for the good of these people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. I want you to think with me this morning about the condition of this woman. There was a hemorrhaging that was taking place. This woman was sick, and she was sick. The Bible says that she had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, this flowing, the, the lack of being able to stop this blood. Now, there was no doubt that this was a miserable condition for her. I don't want to say too much, but just not to have some of the products that we have today. And that's enough said. She was miserable. Now, the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And she's losing this blood. And it's a constant flowing from her. I imagine that not only was there an uncomfortableness about her that she was miserable, but I imagine also that she was weak. There was, a, there was a physical condition that was taking place in her. Maybe she was anemic because of it. Maybe there was a lack of being able to sleep or rest at night because she was so concerned about these things. I don't know exactly what she may have looked like, but she may have looked like the walking dead. Here's this woman. She is miserable. She is sick. This issue of blood. This woman is suffering. The Bible says that she suffered many things. Now, you know, some of us, sometimes when we go through a difficult time in our lives, we are concerned about that one thing that is happening. We're not concerned about other things. Now, here you may have an issue of blood, and this guy over here may have a bad cold. And this guy over here is concerned about his cold. And Lord, you gotta, y'all pray for my cold. Y'all pray that God will help me. Y'all pray that God will touch me. I tell you what, my nose is running all over the place. And here this woman over here is saying, you think you're suffering? But that is concern to him. This is concern to her. Sometimes it is in our lives. We view people through our eyes. And we say, you know, this person hates everybody. The fact of the matter is, we're the ones that hated everybody. You can't trust him. The reason, because we can't trust anybody. And we believe things as we see them. This woman, she suffered. And the Bible says that she suffered many things. She had many needs. This was a long time suffering. She suffered physically, suffered physically. Some years ago, I was in Wilson, North Carolina, and we were right off the interstate, and there's a young man who came, and he wanted to know if I could help him get some gas for his car, and he was in a wheelchair. And so I was interested in it, and I talked with him for a few moments and found out he was from Greenville, South Carolina. That's where I'm from. And I said, uh, where did you go to school? He said, I went to Carolina High School. And I said, ooh, now I went to Parker High School. Parker didn't like Carolina. So after I punched him in the nose, I wanted to talk with him a little bit more. And I asked him, I said, his name was Parker Rice. 
And I asked him, Parker, how did you end up in a wheelchair? And he said, I backslid on God. He said, I got into sin, Brother Steve, and he said, I, I, I know I was saved, I was saved, and he said, I, God kept dealing with me and kept dealing with me, and I said, no, and, and finally, they told me, they said, Parker, you need to get some help, and so he went up into the mountains and joined a camp up there that were trying to help people get off of drugs, and Parker said, I was there, and God speak to my heart, and we would have chapel services, and God would speak to my heart, and I said, no, I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm going, I love my sin, and that's the way a lot of people are. We love much. And Parker said, I was carrying about a five-foot piece of pine out of the woods one day, and a tree fell and hit the backside of that and it crushed my spine from the middle of my back down. And I said, Parker, I'm so sorry that you're in this condition. And he said, Steve, I've been this way for a number of years. And he said, until you're here, you'll never be able to understand what you will do. He said, I've done everything I can to find somebody that'll help me. Don't want to be in this case. This woman had had an issue of blood for 12 years. She suffered physically. And the Bible says that she had gone to many physicians. She had spent all that she had. She was looking for somebody to help me. I'm struggling. And it was a physical struggle. But it was not only a physical struggle... It was also a mental struggle. Have you ever been sick for a good period of time? Did you ever work on your mind? You know, I, I've got this, I've got this debilitating disease. It's a terminal disease. It's called old age. <laughs> I told my wife yesterday, I'm tired of being tired. You ever get that way? <laughs> uh, but sometimes we get sick and we're just tired of being sick. You know, Steve had bronchitis and was out of work for a week. And I'm sure he laid at home saying, boy, I sure am glad I'm able to rest now. I'm glad I'm not over there. And Billy's saying, go do this and go do that. I'm glad I'm not having to look out for the pastor because every time I sit down, here comes the preacher. But it works on us mentally when there's no relief in sight. It's a physical thing, but it's also a mental thing. And this lady had an issue of blood, and it was a suffering in society. The Bible tells us that the priest had a, cleanser, a cleansing Ceremony for women who had babies after they stopped hemorrhaging. And if a woman's continued to hemorrhage, the priest deemed her unclean. It's easy for us to remember the story of the lepers. And leprosy began to eat away the hands and the face and the nose and the toes. And the lepers were to walk through the streets crying, unclean, unclean. Nobody come around me. I'm unclean. This woman, according to law, was unclean. She was not able to participate, supposedly and the societal things. Not only did she suffer physically, not only did she suffer mentally, not only did she suffer so socially, but she suffered financially because she had spent everything she had on many different physicians. This woman was sick, this woman suffered, and this woman was sad. 
Because the Bible says, and nothing better, but rather grew worse. She had sought the professionals, and they could not help her. She had bought the prescriptions that they prescribed, but there was nothing to better. And she was taught by this priest that she was unclean, and there was no help for her whatsoever. She was in a very deplorable state. But that's just her condition because she believed that if she could touch the clothes of Jesus, that she would be healed. Another gospel says the hem of his garment. Notice in verse 27, the Bible says that when she had heard of Jesus, this woman, in order to be able to go forth and touch the Lord Jesus Christ, she needed to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. She heard that he was there. She came to him in the press. He didn't see her coming. She slipped up behind him and stretched out the best she could so that she might be able to touch his garment. She heard, and as a result of her hearing, she hoped that he would heal her. And she had faith that she would be. Do you know the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people, the angels said on that first Christmas morning. What is that good tidings? That he came to forgive. And that if you'll call upon his name, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's, boy, this is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. The fact that salvation is right there so freely given unto whosoever will. But Paul puts forth a question, a problem as well as a correct question. And he said, how shall they believe upon him in whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher? Somebody's got to go tell them. Somebody has got to go tell them. You ever think about your life touching somebody else for eternity's sake? You ever think about you being able to witness to someone that I cannot witness to? But you can. Do you ever think that the person that you are standing before is an opportunity that God has placed in front of you so that you might be able to tell them about Jesus and Jesus' love and how that they could be saved if they believed upon him? This woman, she had faith. She believed if she could just touch, she said, I know that he will heal me. How did she know that? Because she heard of Jesus. The Bible says, Jesus speaking to his disciples, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. Last Sunday night, I had the privilege of being down at Bible Baptist Church, and and uh, Brother Aiken asked me, he said, Brother Steve, would you, would you share something on soul winning? And I said, I'd be more than happy to. And so I took the church over to Acts chapter 14. I'm not asking you to turn right now. But in Acts chapter 14, verse number 17, the Bible says that God hath not left himself without witness. Now, God has given many wonderful things as a witness of God. When you go outside today, is the sun shining today or is it cloudy? I don't know. Eh. Okay. Then tomorrow when the sun's shining, you go out and look at the sun. And you know what the sun says? There's a God. There's a God. Do you know when you go out tonight and you look up into the sky and there's a moon? I don't know what phase it is in, but there's a moon up there. You know what it's going to say? There is a God. There's a God. Ms. Brenda and I will leave after church tonight and we're going to drive up to South Carolina. And up there in Abbeville, South Carolina, we have more stars up in Abbeville than you all have down here in Orlando. To be able to go out there in Abbeville, South Carolina, and there's, uh, you know, they have to pipe the electricity in. There's not hardly anything out there. And so we go out there and stand in the backyard and look up into the skies and see all these beautiful stars. But you know what I found out? 
They got more stars in West Africa than they do in Abbeville. Because there's no lights there. And you look up into the skies and you understand what the psalmist said. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day they utter speech. What has God got? He's got a witness that there's a God in heaven. But do you know the creation of God does not tell you that God loves you? It only tells you he exists. God's revealed his love to us through Jesus Christ, his son. And that's why we need to tell others, they may believe that there's a God. Oh, yes, I know there's a God. There's nothing that could be put together like this is without a divine creator. And God said, that's my witness, the seasons and the rains and the sun and the moon. The God has placed these things there as a witness unto himself. Jesus says that when the Spirit of God comes upon you as an individual, now... You become my witness. For he says, ye shall be witnesses unto me. People need to hear. We need to share. There's hindrances. There's always a hindrance. There's always hindrances. This woman here, the Bible says of her condition that she was weak. She was without strength. And I'm reminded that in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 6, for those of us to take and put a spiritual application to this in our lives, the Bible says that when we were, out with, when we were without strength, I'm so glad that Jesus Christ died for us. See, I'm saved today not because of me, not because I decided I'm going to be a good little boy from now on. I'm saved today because of the power of an almighty God that loved me and gave himself for me. And I'm saved today because it is through his power that he keeps me, that he keeps me. I am kept by the power of God, Peter says. Jude says, I'm preserved in Jesus Christ. That just means I'm getting sweeter and sweeter. Aren't you happy about that? These hindrances are there. Her hindrance was with a crowd. There was people there. They were keeping her away. I said last week that she losing her strength, probably pressing aside, pushing aside as much as she could and getting as close as she possibly could and extending her reach as far as she possibly could just to touch his clothes if I could. But this crowd was there. Can I tell you that there are times when we need the Lord Jesus Christ and we need to touch him? And it seems like there's hindrances there. Can I just encourage you? Keep on keeping on. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. Keep going, keep reaching, keep striving. It's persistence. Paul even said to the church at Galatia, you'll reap in due season if you faint not. Not only was she said steadfast, but she summoned the power of God. And that came through her faith. And when she touched him, immediately she knew she was healed of her plague in her body. And she slipped away. Slipped away quietly. Slipped away politely. I don't want to make a big deal over this. But Jesus stopped. And Jesus said, listen, somebody's touched me. Somebody has drawn on the power that I possess. 
And he said, it's no longer for you to be polite. I want to hear you. And he looked and saw this lady. And the Bible says that she came. She was fearful. She was trembling. And she confessed, it is I. It is so important for us to tell others what Jesus Christ has done for us. All of this came as a result of her desire, if I could just touch his clothes, she said, I'll be cured. I just reach out and touch him. And her cure was an immediate cure. Her cure was an inward cure. She may have still looked the same lady. She may have still been dressed in rags. She may have still looked like a poor woman. She may have still looked like the, the, the same woman that had come in earlier into the press that was sick of this blood of issue for 12 long years. But something had taken place in her. That's what salvation does for you. There was a confession made. The Bible says there in Mark chapter 5, verse 33, her fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him. It's strange. The Bible says and told him all the truth. He didn't need to know. He didn't need to hear the words from her. He knew what had taken place. But you know, he delights in conversing with his children. I hope my grandchildren never speak to me again. I say, Pastor, what? You love those babies. Oh, yeah, and I delight in them. Uh, Bethany is what, 13 years old now? Bethany is 13 years old. When I think of Bethany... I think of a little girl about this tall, little blonde-haired girl busting through those doors hollering, Papa! And every Sunday she came from the nursery and that's what happened. I love it when those boys say, Papa! Boy, I don't have to do anything. I gave Lainey, this is Kelly's little girl, I gave her a purse from Africa. And you know what her grandmother did? She said, where's your money? And that little two-year-old said, Munner, I don't have any money. And you know what that woman did? She said, go ask your papa. <laughs> Pat, what would you do one of those little, uh, no, I'm not going to say that. You know what you would do. Do you know the Lord delights in our conversations with him? Just conversing with him. He knows our need before we even ask. But he said, ask and you shall receive. He knew what had taken place in this woman's life. Now, folks, I'm just, let me give you two quick thoughts. Number one, a principle for us in this story. It's not the outward healing that we should give a lot of thought to today. But it's what took place on the inside because her healing took place here before it took place here. Woman, thy faith have made thee whole. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. For they that come unto God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. The second thing is the peace. I love the hymn, Peace, Peace, Wonderful Peace, coming down from the Father above. 
Sweep over my spirit and help me today. I'm glad that the peace of God that passes all understanding is mine. Jesus said, be of good comfort. That's the peace. There may be turmoil all around, but for the believer, there's still peace. Bow with me for a word of prayer. I don't know what your situation is today. I don't know why you're here today. Pastor, I'm here because I'm supposed to be in church. This is my church. I'm happy about that. Maybe you're visiting with us today. I don't know why you're here. But I believe that God has something for us today. Have faith in God. We need to believe him, folks. Let's stay close to him. Let's stay close to him. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking about. Just for a moment, I wonder if there's someone here today and you say, Pastor, if I were to die today, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me, preacher? Would you slip your hand up just long enough for me to see it so that I might be able to intelligently pray with you and for you? Pastor, I'm unsure about heaven. I'm not sure. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for it? God bless you. I'm going to pray for you. God bless you. I'm going to pray for you. The thing that drew me to the Lord Jesus Christ, apart from the preaching of the Word of God, I don't remember what Bob Ware preached the night I got saved. I was saved under his ministry. But I do remember him standing there saying that if you'll come to Jesus, he'll give you peace. And I said, that's what I need. I need peace. And maybe you're here today and you don't have peace. Why don't you come to Jesus? My Heavenly Father, would you speak to our hearts? Would you help us this morning? Would you do that which only you can do? I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand together, heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking about. Just for a moment, if God has spoken to your heart this morning, I encourage you to do business with God as he does business with you. You want to get saved? Why don't you come this morning and let me take the Bible and show you how you can be. So, Pastor, I, I'll just be honest with you. I just, my life seems to be a wreck. I don't have any peace. Why don't you come and talk to Jesus? Maybe we can go out and pray with you and pray for you. Whatever your need is, I want to ask you to come. Tom and I are here to help you this morning. You come. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Kelly's going to begin to play an invitational hymn. There's someone else needs to come. Someone else. Why don't you come get it right this morning? Get it done. Get it done. Get things taken care of. If God has spoken to your heart, you need to get things taken care of. He's dealing with you again. Someone else? Someone else? When you bring it to him, you tap in to the power, all power. There's nothing too hard for him. Someone else need to come? Wonderful. God bless. God bless you. Someone else need to come? Want somebody to pray with you, pray for you? God bless you. Thank you, Paul. God bless you. Thank you, Marcia. Oh, for us to get our hearts right with God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one looking about. 
Could you sing this invitational hymn that Kelly's playing? I'll try to help you with the words. It's just as I am. Softly, heads bowed, eyes closed. Just as I am without one plea. Without one plea. But that thy blood. Thank you, Tom. Was shed for me. Shed for me. And that thou biddest. Me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. Of God, I come. I come. My Heavenly Father, we bow our unworthy heads and we thank you. Thank you, Father, for the Word of God. Thank you for the Spirit of God. Father, I pray that you'd please help these who have slipped off to a prayer room. I pray that you would just somehow, some way, work in their hearts and lives. Give them that grand and glorious assurance of salvation, Father. I pray that you would help them. These who have knelt around these steps, I pray that you would work in their hearts and lives. Hear their cries, Father. Hear their prayers. Do that which only you can do. Thank you for these people who have been tolerant of me. Lord, I ask you that you'd bless them as we go our separate ways. Help us, Lord, to remember that the people around us need to hear about Jesus. And help us to share Jesus saves. Bless us as we go, we ask. And you bring us back together tonight rejoicing in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Remember, next Sunday, 10 o'clock, right here in the auditorium. 10 o'clock.